Welcome back. Moving forward, in this lesson, I'm going to talk about the project scope management, or how do you actually plan the project scope management? So fairly in-depth and detailed, but important, because now you're at a stage within managing a project where you need to ensure what are the inputs, what's going to happen in the middle, right? The processes, and then, of course, the outputs. So I've structured it in a way which is easier because now you know what the inputs are, like your product charter, for example, is your input where it defines everything. Other inputs include the project management plan, the quality management plan, the statement of work, and so forth. And then once you have all of that as a project manager, then you get into the processes. How do I actually manage? How do I execute? How do I monitor? How do I communicate with my teams? Whether I communicate every single day or weekly meetings and so on. So I'm going to talk about and also what tools to use, by the way whether you use Microsoft Project Scheduler, the Gantt chart, the PERT chart. So I'm going to talk about those as well. And then, of course, the outputs as well. So once you have the inputs, the processes, you need to make sure that your projects are successfully completed. So let's dive in and then take a look at details of project scope management. Welcome back. Moving forward in this chapter or lesson, I'm going to talk about the project scope management. So now that we already have all the documentation in place, the project charter is there given to the PM. And now we're going to take a look at the work breakdown structures. In other words, the next steps, right? So you have all those teams put together. Each of these teams will provide you certain input. And then we'll take a look at what we need to do with those inputs. In other words, how many hours is going to take to do each task and so forth. So each of your team members are going to provide you those inputs. You are going to, as a project manager, place them into a work breakdown structure and we'll go from there. So the entire scope of the project is something that we'll detail out next. So here's the overview. The scope management includes all of the processes that are required to ensure that the project includes all of the work required. Once again, all of the tasks coming from the dev team, coming from the QA side, and so on. And only the work required to complete the project successfully. So the scope needs to be well-defined, transparent, and then created in a manner so that it encompasses, right, includes all of the relevant or pertinent tasks. And you, as a project manager, does not want to include additional tasks that are extra. So managing the project scope is primarily concerned with not only defining, but also controlling what is and is not included in the project. And this is fairly common because if you're working on a project on a daily basis and you're having these client calls on a daily basis, your client may ask you things that are sort of relevant to the project, but yet they're new development. So as a project manager, you need to have a keen eye out for any new processes in place because that would entail a change order and not necessarily just something part of the existing scope. So this is kind of an important, but as you gain more experience into the PM field, you will get more good and more skilled at this. So the scope management processes, first I'm going to talk about just the simple concept of plan scope management that I just mentioned earlier, the process of creating a scope management plan that documents how the project and product scope will be defined, validated and controlled. The collection of requirements is simply the process of determining, documenting, and then managing all of the stakeholder needs and requirements to meet the desired objectives. So everything is documented, right? So if you have a well-scoped out plan, as we say, it's easier to manage and then execute. So the defined scope, the process of developing a detailed description of the product or the project itself. And then we create the WBS, which is the work breakdown structure, which is simply the process of taking all the tasks that you have provided by the team members and then subdividing project deliverables and project work into smaller, more manageable chunks or components. 
Validate scope is simply the process of formalizing acceptance of the completed project or deliverables, and then controlling the scope is the process of monitoring the status of the project. So all of this is part of the scope management. So as a quick homework, just go through these definitions a few times so that you're kind of familiar with all of these meanings of what they actually mean. So in the real world, typically you just create the scope, you have the WBS, and then you move forward as a project manager, start managing the task after you schedule those tasks in Microsoft Project Schedule or any other software. So in the project context, the term scope can be either product or project. So the product, what we mean is the features and functions that characterize a product, service, or result. Whereas if you're talking about the project scope, we mean the work performed to deliver a product, service, or result with the specified features and functions. So the term project scope is sometimes viewed as including the product scope as well, but just subtle difference between the two. First, the plan scope management includes, again, the inputs, the tools in the middle, and then, of course, the outputs. So the scope management, once again, is the process of creating a scope plan that documents how the project or the product scope will be defined, validated, and controlled. So the only key benefit of this process that you need to remember is that it provides guidance and direction on how scope will be managed throughout the project. That's all it is. It's just like a check and balance and the project manager kind of knows where to go and what are the boundaries, right? So you're just setting the boundaries of the project itself and both from the client perspective as well as the internal stakeholders. So everyone is on the same page and a good project manager kind of knows and well defines the scope. Here's a quick data flow diagram. Once again, you have the project charter coming from the previous chapter that is made part of the project plan itself for the organization. Scope management is created and then you end up with the scope management plan where you detail of the requirements of the management plan, which is again a component of the project or the program management that describes how the scope will be defined, monitored, developed, controlled, or validated. So the collect requirements, again, these are the detailed part of the scope plan itself. Collect requirements is simply the process of determining, documenting, and then managing stakeholders' expectations. The key benefit, of course, is that it provides the basis for defining the product scope and project scope. And the reason why we're going through this is so, just so that you are comfortable with the PIMBOX 6 guide itself. In the real world, okay, some of these things are not really followed per se to in letter and spirit, but yet the entire concept is, remains the same. And as you get more experienced into the project, because as a project manager, most likely, you're not managing a single project, right? So your company is giving you like three, four different projects to manage, depending on the workload. And each of those four projects means quite a bit of work, right? So, and, and those projects could be different. One could be a software development project. The other could be an internal project, could be a, a different kind of project and so on. So you need to understand and just kind of read through it about the concept of scope management, although I have highlighted the important key areas so far. So here in collect requirements, the inputs are project charter, project management plan, project documents, the assumption logs, business documents, and so on. And then the tools that you can use is expert judgment. You can gather additional data. You can do some data analysis on your own. You can make some decisions and so forth. And of course, the output is the requirements documentations or the requirements traceability matrix that we're going to take a look at. So here's the contextual diagram and then the requirements of the traceability matrix. It's just a document, a grid that you can use as a project manager. So the context diagram is fairly straightforward. 
you have the internal user profiles, you have the external job postings, for instance, the internal job postings and the external all in the center, whereas from this emanates hiring managers, internal associates, internal full-time, part-time contractors, and so on. So on the left side, you'll have the internal users, and then the right entails the external users. So the traceability matrix is simply something that you would log down or jot down based on different IDs, the requirement description, the business needs, project objectives, the work background structure deliverables, and so on. So defining the scope is the process of developing a detailed description of the project or product, as I mentioned earlier. And again, the benefit is that this process is that it describes the product or the service or result boundaries and acceptance criteria. And again, I've covered this earlier just to reiterate some of these inputs, tools, and outputs so you can easily see and just kind of practice with this as well. Read through it. This is self-explanatory. The key points is something that I'm talking about. The rest of the areas, you can read through it. And again, this is your homework too because you'd have to work on your own as well when it comes to the theoretical part. Creating the WBS, one of the things that I want to mention is the process of subdividing tasks. Let me show you a WBS in the real world that we actually use uh, so that you understand how these tasks are delivered to us. So I'm going to go and open up Microsoft Excel and open up a sample WBS for a real project. So here in Excel, I've opened up a work breakdown structure. So this is the WBS. Make this a little bigger so you can actually see. So it starts off with, let's say, the sequence, phase, index, developers. Let me zoom in a little bit. And then just going through these headings, right? So I'm at row number seven here, for instance. I'm going across. So you'll notice the justification remarks column, the complexity analysis design, the user interface development, unit testing, bug fixing, dev lead, total, and then all of these are hours, by the way. So for instance, the installation and configuration, the initial install and configuration, is gonna take about hour and 20 minutes. The development is gonna take eight hours and so on. So these numbers are provided by the respective departments from the team leads so that you as a project manager would now have a better understanding of what is going to be the total number of hours spent on each of these tasks and subtasks. For example, in this particular project, we did the doc gen installation, we did the Mohimbi installation, the visit installation and configuration. So each of them entails a set of hours or the main task will contain hours. If it does not have, let's say, zero hours, then that's something that we're not, in fact, doing, although this was part of the WBS. So, for example, SharePoint farm setup. So we are going to do SharePoint installation and configuration. That's going to take about an hour, hour and a half by each of these individuals. Notice we don't name the individuals here. These are just the hours provided to you from the respective departments. And then you as a project manager would take these tasks and then place them into the project schedule using project server or any other tool that you wish to use. So just to give you a high level overview of this particular document, and in the end, it tells you that it's 921 hours for this particular phase or project, or whatever that is. So as a project manager, you now know the costs typically involved you can come up with those. You can also take a look at these different tasks as well. So just a real world scenario for work breakdown structure. As a homework, go ahead, search the internet, download different kinds, because again, these are customizable. This is, for instance, our version, but you can also use any other WBS that you use. So if you have any questions, just post them in the discussion area or browse the internet and then I'll be happy to kind of see what you actually find yourself. So here's your homework, right? Great. So let's go back to our slides. Perfect. So you understand the work breakdown structure is simply the process of subdividing project deliverables. Here's a simple WBS data flow diagram. 
Once again, fairly straightforward. It is just a hierarchical decomposition of the total scope of work to be carried out by the project team to accomplish the project objectives and create the required deliverables. And that's exactly what we saw in the Excel sheet as demonstrated the WBS itself. Here's a sample WBS, again, just a sample portion of the full-blown work breakdown structure with some branches of the WBS decomposed down through the work package level as shown in the diagram. Again, you can take a look at this. You have the value management system project on top divided into needs assessment, standards development, and so on. The needs assessment has further sub-tasks, right? So you can see the labels going from 1 to 1.1 1 .1, and then 1.1.1 1 .1 .1, and so forth. So you get the idea. Of course, you have to validate the scope, which is the process of formalizing acceptance of the completed project deliverables. And of course, the key benefit of this process is that it brings objectivity to the acceptance process. So if you have a detailed WBS, you have everything laid out, a well scoped out plan, it's easier for all of the stakeholders to accept, whether it's the client side or the internal senior management. And finally, the control scope. So control scope is the process of monitoring the status of the project. So you just don't create the scope uh, of the project itself, but also you need to control it and kind of monitor it and make sure everything stays within the set boundaries. The key benefit of this is that the scope baseline is maintained throughout the project. And baseline simply means that you have, let's say, dates allocated to each of these subtasks, but yet these dates could possibly change because there may be holidays that you did not account for, or the employees may be shuffled here and there, or the client delays could happen. So what you do is you simply create a baseline date. So everything is baselined from your actual product. Perfect. So in this chapter, we took a look at the project scope management, how to lay out the scope itself, how to become transparent, how to create the WBS. What is a WBS? It's just a division of the subtasks provided by different employees or team leads of different departments. And you as a project manager, your role is to ensure that the project tasks, the scope remains within the set boundaries and it meets the expectations of both the client as well as the stakeholders, whether they're internal or external. So I hope this helps. Go through it. If you have any questions, post them in the discussion area. With this, let's move to the next lesson.